Hey, what's up everyone? In this video, I'm going to show you how you can capture a direct feed from your arcade games that can then be recorded and streamed. I'm also going to show you what doesn't work so well and the many challenges I ran into. Hopefully this will help you avoid some of the headaches I faced and if nothing else, save you some money. So buckle up and let me take you back a few months. Gameplay videos are one of my favorite types of arcade videos to do, but I've never been entirely happy with them. And this is mostly due to the recording process, which provides some major challenges. First, there's no simple way of directly capturing the video signal like you would say with a console or PC game. This basically means that you're limited to pointing a camera at the arcade monitor. Depending on the game, this can be extremely tricky as it's often difficult to find a good camera angle that provides a nice view of the monitor while at the same time does not interfere with the player's position. In many cases, it's nearly impossible to accomplish both and a compromise is usually made. This usually means having to stand slightly off to the side while playing or limiting your movements for fear of obstructing the view. The other major challenge is the quality of the recorded picture. While camera technology has come a long way, I have yet to find a camera that perfectly synchronizes with all arcade games perfectly. This means having to put up with some form of these dark refresh lines moving across the image. I do find that it's less noticeable with some games than others, but it's there nonetheless. Even recording at 60 frames per second and some tedious shutter speed and aperture tweaks, I can get close with a decent picture, but in the end, I'm still always unsatisfied. So last January, I decided to seek out a better solution. I wanted to see if there was a way that I could capture a direct feed from my arcade games while playing them, similar to how someone would capture footage from say their Nintendo, Xbox, or PlayStation. Like any other project, the first thing I did was hit Google, since chances are I'm not the first one to think of this, and someone has probably already done it. So naturally, I was surprised when I had trouble finding any information that pertained to what I was trying to do. I checked a bunch of forums, and most of what I could find were folks trying to capture footage from their super guns, or people trying to stream a feed from a single JAMA cabinet for fighting game tournaments. While both of these somewhat related to what I was trying to do, neither of them really fit my criteria for what I wanted to accomplish. For instance, although super guns run arcade hardware, they don't have their own arcade monitors and usually have additional hardware that allows them to easily connect to displays, much like a console. This differs quite a bit from my case as I want to be able to capture a direct feed from my arcade games while playing on the cabinet without affecting anything. The same goes for the folks trying to stream fighting games from a single cabinet. Although they are playing on the cabinet while streaming, which is what I want to do, their solution isn't very portable and is meant to be mounted inside the cabinet. On top of that, the devices they are using are strictly JAMA based and usually require readjusting the monitors in their cabinets. After doing a bit more digging, I ultimately gave up and decided that I was on my own for this project. That's not to say that I didn't find any more useful information. I did, which I'll get into later, but for now I was on my own. So to begin, what am I trying to accomplish? Obviously I want to be able to capture a direct feed from my arcade games while playing them, but what are my criteria for this project? Well, for starters, it must be portable. I want to easily go from game to game without having to move each cabinet and get inside it. So on that note, it must also be external. And it must be able to work with all of my games, not just the JAMA ones. After all, I have more classic non-JAMA games than JAMA ones. It cannot affect the original hardware, namely the monitor. I don't want to have to adjust and readjust each monitor every time I'm going to record a game. Lastly, the picture should be high quality, preferably HD like 720 or 1080p. It should look much better than the camera footage, otherwise, what's the real point? Okay, so that's my tall order. From here, things began primitively. I'm not great at sketching, but I do find that it always helps me visualize if I draw things out. I decided to use Toki as my test cabinet for this project. The first thing that would need to be done was splitting the video signal. One signal would go to the arcade monitor and one for the captured feed. I began by building a simple harness that passively split the RGB, sync, and ground wires. Next up was getting the video signal converted into something that my capture card would accept. After a little research, I came across the Gombe's GBS8220 CGA to VGA converter. These are commonly used in arcade cabinets to replace a CRT monitor with an LCD. It accepts a standard RGB, sync, and ground signal and converts it to a variety of resolutions accepted by computer monitors, outputting the signal via a VGA port. At $25, it was easily worth a shot. However, although the resolutions the converter outputs are widely supported by most displays, it doesn't output at 720 or 1080p, which is what my capture card supports. 
On top of that, my capture card only has HDMI inputs. To solve this, I purchased this OREI XD600 VGA upscaler. This not only upscales the signal coming from my converter to 720 and 1080p, but it also outputs the signal via HDMI. And like the converter, it was inexpensive, around $27. As for the audio, well, we'll save that for later. Okay, here's a quick recap of my game plan. After splitting the video signal, one end will run to the monitor, the other end will run to the GBS8220 converter, which will then output a VGA signal. From there, it will go into my VGA upscaler, get upscaled to 720 or 1080p, and send that signal into my capture card via an HDMI cable. So that's the plan, but for testing purposes, I decided to skip the capture card and simply run the signal into a spare computer monitor to see how it looked. I wanted to isolate the converter and test the video signal coming out of it, and this way I can eliminate any potential variables that might arise from the capture card alone. Now that I was all set, I fired everything up, and it wasn't pretty. Right off the bat, there were obvious problems. The first and most obvious issue was the image coming from the converter. It was jumping and jittering all over the place, sometimes even losing the signal entirely. The other major issue was the image on the arcade monitor. It was much darker than usual. I could still see the picture, but it looked like someone turned the brightness down a bit. Using my multimeter, I discovered that when the video signal was split, the RGB and sync voltages that ran to the monitor were only about half of what they should be, resulting in the darker image. It was clear that passively splitting the video signal without amplifying it wasn't going to work. As for the jumpy image coming from the converter, I messed around with some of the settings, trying different resolutions and changing some of the position and size adjustments. After spending some serious time playing around with these settings, I was able to get a mostly stable image. However, the deal breaker for me was when I tried a different game and discovered that it required entirely different settings to get a stable image. This meant that I would more than likely need to spend some serious time adjusting the converter settings each time I went from one game to another, and that just wasn't practical. I also noticed that the overall picture quality wasn't great. There was an overall softer look, and the converter appeared to have trouble with more detailed areas, particularly during parts of fast motion, resulting in small artifacts where there shouldn't be. Now, of course, I can't complain too much for a device that cost me only $25, and I can understand why these converters are so common, but after spending the next couple of days adjusting settings, I decided to throw in the towel on the GBS8220. And so it was back to the drawing board. First, I was going to need a new solution for converting the video signal. Second, I was going to need a method for amplifying the split video signal running to the arcade monitor. I hopped back on Google and started digging again. After reading a bunch of forums, I came across several video converters, but two devices in particular seemed to get the most praise. These were the XRGB Mini, also known as the FrameMeister, and the OSSC, or Open Source Scan Converter. Both devices are aimed at the serious retro gamer that wants to play their old consoles on newer displays. While I'm not necessarily the target consumer, these devices appear to be exactly what I'm looking for. They are built to take an older, lower res video signal and convert it into a high quality HD signal that newer displays, or in my case my capture card, can accept. The downside is the price. As I said, these are aimed at the serious retro gamer, and at the time of this recording the OSSC is roughly $180 and the FrameMeister is about $330. I guess you get what you pay for. For the sake of experimentation and this video, I decided to buy both devices so that I could compare them. I tested the OSSC first. Since it has a VGA input, I figured it'd be simplest to use that. Mike's Arcade sells these little adapters that take an arcade RGB and sync signal and adapt it to a D sub 15 port, also known as VGA style. So using a VGA cable, I connected one end to one of these adapters and the other end to the OSSC's VGA input. I connected the HDMI out to my computer monitor for testing purposes. I fired up Toki, and to my amazement, I had a crystal clear picture immediately. Even before changing any settings, I was impressed with the quality of the image. Later on, I did tweak some settings, but I'll get into that later. Running the OSSC into my upscaler and capture card also worked flawlessly. Next was testing the FrameMeister. Since it doesn't have a VGA input, I opted to use the SCART input since that provides a great RGB connection. The OSSC also has a SCART connection, so I figured it was in my best interest to use that as well, especially since it provides a cleaner signal than VGA. 
Using a wiring diagram I found online, I built a small VGA discard adapter cable. I connected the VGA end to the Mike's Arcade adapter and the SCART end to the Framemeister. After powering it on and firing up Toki, I was again surprised at how good the image looked. After spending some time with both devices and testing them with several games, I concluded that they both provide an equivalent high quality image and I wouldn't put one above the other. It's true they are slightly different, but all in all, both are solid solutions. That being said, I would recommend the OSSC over the Framemeister simply due to the price. So with that piece of the puzzle solved, I needed to find a solution for amplifying the split video signal. After some more digging, I came across this VGA Arcade Amplifier by Altimark. It's designed to amplify the video signal coming from VGA video cards to bring the video signal up to the level required by arcade monitors. Examples of this would be MAME cabinets using arcade CRT monitors or the Pinball 2000 machines that use CRT monitors. Even though my project wasn't quite the same, at $23, it sounded promising enough to give it a shot. Per the instructions, I wired up a 5 volt power supply to the amplifier that it requires. I then plugged the amp into the mic's arcade adapter and ran the wiring into the monitor. With the 5 volts plugged in, I fired up Toki, but got no picture. I was puzzled for a bit, but then realized the issue. The amplifier works by taking the voltage on pin 9 and converting it to 4 volts. But the Mike's Arcade adapter doesn't provide any voltage on that pin, so there is nothing to convert, hence no picture. To remedy this, I took a cheap powered VGA splitter I had laying around and added that in line, figuring it might provide some voltage on pin 9. I plugged the Mike's Arcade adapter on the input and the amplifier on one of the outputs. I fired up Toki again, and voila, I got a bright picture. It was almost a little too bright, but not bad. I could live with it. The problem now was that I had this ugly mess, and while, yes, it worked, it just wasn't very practical, especially from a portability standpoint. Still, it was a solution. A few days later, as I was trying to figure out how to make this all more portable, I stumbled upon the Arcade Projects forum where one of the users had created a device called the Split Fire, something made to allow for streaming and recording JAMA games. At $100, this device is designed for splitting the video signal while also buffering it, allowing the signal to be split without affecting the image on the arcade monitor. This means no dim arcade monitors. The device features a simple VGA-style D-Sub15 port for outputting the video signal to a capture device, as well as a 3.5mm audio jack for also sending out audio. There's also a video gain knob, as well as one for audio gain. Without question, this looked to be the most promising device for my needs, albeit not without a couple of things to address that I'll get to in a minute. Once my split fire arrived, I decided to test it out in my Toki cabinet since it is a JAMA game. The device simply plugs into the PCB and then into the JAMA harness, sandwiching itself between them. From there, it's just a matter of plugging in a VGA cable for the video and a 3.5mm audio cable for the sound. In my case, I used a VGA extension cable so that I could use my VGA discard adapter. After connecting the video output to the OSSC, I fired up Toki. The OSSC accepted the signal just fine and I had a nice bright picture. So far so good. But now, the real test, how does the image look on the arcade monitor? To my delight, the image looked perfect, exactly how it should, the same way it would if the video signal wasn't being split at all. Excellent. I now had a much more practical solution to splitting the video signal without the hassle of a cluttered mess. Or did I? Before I got too excited, there was an obvious question that I needed to address. How can this be made portable? It's designed to sit inside an arcade cabinet, but I needed to work externally outside of the cabinets. I decided that the only real practical way to make this portable would be to wire up some Molex connectors directly to the device that I could then use to connect it to my arcade cabinets. Originally, I was going to solder wires directly to the board, but then thought of a much easier approach. Since this is a JAMA device, why not take advantage of it? So, I purchased a cheap JAMA extension harness and cut it in half. Plugging each half into the device, I now had all the wires I needed attached to it without any soldering required. After crimping a few connectors, I had this. It turns out that the split fire runs solely off the 5 volts, making power fairly easy. I used this 5 volt DC power adapter to take care of that and crimped a simple Molex connector for easy connectivity. Then one connector for video in and one for video out. 
and of course one for audio in. With the split fire ready, it was now time to figure out how I was going to wire up the cabinets themselves to make them easy to plug into. I didn't want to have to pull the cabinets out each time I wanted to record a game, so having easy access to the front was a must. My plan was to wire things up so that I could access everything from the coin door. I would essentially need to extend the video wiring to the monitor so that I could reach the coin door and then splice in a set of Molex connectors to allow the split fire to plug into. I would also do the same for the audio. To connect the split fire to the cabinet, I would use two harnesses, each with the same style Molex connectors, one for the video input and one for the output. This ended up working quite well, but I did run into some issues early on. Upon my first test with Toki, I noticed I was getting some strange ghosting artifacts in the picture, particularly around the letters and numbers. I suspected it had to do with grounding issues, and I was right. So I discovered that by extending the video wiring as much as I did, I actually made it much more sensitive to grounding issues. Think of it like amplifying an antenna. But it also meant that if any of my games had problems with grounding, if the grounding throughout the cabinet wasn't absolutely perfect, that those flaws, as small as they may be, would now show up in the picture. So to solve this, the first thing I had to do was go through every one of my games and check the grounding throughout the cabinet and make sure it was absolutely perfect, uh, especially in relation to the power supply and the earth ground. I do have to admit, I was pretty surprised at how many of my games had grounding issues that needed to be addressed. I would say at least four or five of these cabinets had improper grounding in one form or another. I guess I never really thought about it much up until this point just because the games all appeared to play fine and work fine uh, until now. Now with all my cabinets grounded properly, I still wasn't out of the woods. The other piece to the puzzle was the wire itself that I was using. I was using a heavy gauge and shielded wire which turned out to be picking up interference. To remedy this, I ended up buying a spool of heavy duty double shielded Cat7 cable. This worked perfectly as it has 8 wires which is more than enough for my needs. It's also inexpensive, running about $30 on Amazon for 100 feet. I replaced the video wiring with the Cat7 cable, as well as my harnesses. As I mentioned, it's double shielded and far more protected from interference, but for the shielding to be most effective, the drain wire needs to be grounded. So I did that with both the cabinet wiring and my split fire harness. Since the monitor chassis is connected to earth ground, attaching the drain wire to the chassis works just fine. As for my harness, I crimped a small connector to the drain wire and added another to the cabinet ground near the coin door, making it easy to connect the drain wire to ground. After all is said and done, I now have a perfect picture. So what about the audio? How will that work? Well, just like the video, I built a little harness for connecting the cabinet sound to the split fire. I could then run a 3.5mm audio cable from the split fire and use a quarter inch adapter to connect it to my audio interface on my computer. As for the sound coming from the cabinet speaker, well, that's a little tricky. Since I'm planning on wearing a microphone while streaming, I'm concerned that it will pick up any sound coming from the speaker and introduce an echo effect. So to prevent that, I wired up a quarter inch phono connector that's tied into my harness. I can then plug this into a headphone amplifier and use a set of headphones to hear the game audio while playing. Since I'm disconnecting the speaker when I plug my harness in, there won't be any sound coming from the cabinet. Problem solved. All right, so we're nearing the end of the tunnel. The big challenge now is how to make all of this portable. But before that, let's recap how everything will connect to each other. First, power is applied to the split fire. The split fire is then connected to the arcade cabinet using two harnesses for the video, one for the video going to the split fire, and one for the video passing out of the split fire, which is then sent to the arcade monitor. Audio from the cabinet is also connected to the split fire, as well as a headphone amp, which requires its own power. Video is then sent from the split fire to the OSSC via a VGA to SCART cable. Power for the OSSC is connected as well. Audio is sent out from the split fire and into my USB audio interface connected to my computer. The OSSC is then connected to the upscaler. In my case, I'm using the FrameMeister and connecting it via the HDMI, but any decent upscaler would work just fine and be far more cost efficient. Of course, the upscaler requires its own power as well. From the upscaler, the signal is finally sent into the capture card via HDMI. In my case, the capture card is the Elgato HD60 Pro. 
All right, so I just wanted to clarify one thing here. I did mention that I'm using the FrameMeister as my upscaler with the OSSC. However, I am not recommending this, and I'm not recommending that you do the same. Simply put, this is just too much overkill. Um, I would recommend something instead like this ORREI XD600 upscaler. This does a fine job of upscaling the image, and this is $27, this is $330. Now, I love the FrameMeister. I think uh, it works fantastic in tandem with the OSSC. Uh, but it's just it's just too much. This is $330, this is $27. The only reason why I'm using this is that I have it. I bought this with the OSSC to compare, and I don't see myself selling this anytime soon, so I may as well use it. And I do love the features, but again, I'm not recommending you do the same. It's just not cost efficient. Uh, with that said, that begs the question, well, why do you need an upscaler in the first place? Why don't you just run the OSSCs directly into your capture card. And while you can do that with some resolutions, uh, a lot of the resolutions that the OSSC outputs uh, simply aren't supported by most capture cards, including the one I'm using, which is the Elgato HD60 Pro. Uh, I like to use Line 4X, and the reason why I don't use Line 5X, which is a 1080p signal, is that it crops the image. So if you use Line 5X, it is a standard 1920 by 1080 uh, resolution, but it ends up cropping some of the lines of the image, and I don't want that. So I use line 4X. Now, what that ends up translating into is that if you're talking like Marble Madness here, uh, that's a 240p resolution, meaning it's 320 pixels roughly horizontally by 240 vertically. And if you multiply that by four, it ends up being about a 1280 horizontal resolution by 960 pixels vertically. My capture card doesn't handle that. So I end up using an upscaler to get that up to 1080p without there being any cropping. So that's a long-winded way of, of, of saying that's why I'm using an upscaler. Now, with that said, if you can find a capture card that handles all those resolutions, or at least the one that you're gonna use, uh, yeah, you could probably save some money and forego the upscaler. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so now with four different devices all requiring their own power and a ton of cords, making this thing portable wasn't gonna be as easy as I thought. In the end, I opted for this Tankstorm heart protective case that had a thick foam interior. It was a bit ambitious, but I was pretty sure I could pull it off. So after a lot of tedious work and finesse, I finally came up with this, and while it's a bit cruder than I would like, it does exactly what I need it to do. So yeah, let's take a closer look. All right, let's open this baby up here. Okay, so right off the shoot, here are my two remotes. This is for the OSSC, this is for the FrameMeister. Uh, they both have remotes, you can adjust the settings, so I like to keep them in here. But typically when I'm connecting this to one of my arcade games, I open this up and I, the first thing I do is I pull the remotes, throw them off to the side, and then I pull this guy off here, um, which reveals the OSSC. Now, I, I get a little worried about all this foam as insulation. That's why I keep this open the whole, the whole time. Plus, um, you know, if I need to adjust anything like my headphone volume and, and whatnot. But uh, this is the basic layout. Now, here's obviously the split fire. And this is my headphone amp. Then I've got a little power strip here. Now, you may notice this only has three ports. Now, I've got four devices that require power, and this only has three ports. Well. Underneath all this is basically all the cabling, all the power cords, everything like that. It's all tucked underneath here. And I bought one of those um, kind of like two-in-one uh, plugs so I could eliminate the need for a, a fourth power plug on this power strip. And the reason why I got this power strip is that it's really thin and it doesn't take up a whole lot of surface area. So yeah, and here's my OSSC. And if I take this foam out of here, and by the way, this foam was a pain in the ass to work on, uh, mostly just because I, had end, I ended up using a scissors to have to cut, even though there's little squares that you can pull away, uh, because of the size and shape of all this stuff, I had to kind of uh, really mold it and use a scissors to kind of custom fit everything. But underneath the OSSC is my FrameMeister, uh, the upscaler. And you can actually see here, this, the, this is the SCART cable, 
And originally I had a plastic shielding uh, cover for this, but I had to remove it just because it took up too much space. And that was kind of, you know, the name of the game here is space. And uh, yeah, I, I probably spent a good three hours at least getting this all to fit snugly in here. But somehow, one way or, the, or another, it uh, ended up working out. So yeah, that's the basic layout. Now, as I said, all the cables are basically, the power cords and everything, are basically tucked underneath here. Um, so anyways, let's take a look at the sides. Things get a little interesting there. Okay, so on the first side, this is the side where the split fire would be, right on top here. So first off, we've got our Molex for the video in. Then we've got our audio in Molex. Then we've got the Molex for the video out. This would feed the monitor coming from the split fire. And then underneath here, we've got our quarter inch phono plug for the audio in. This feeds our headphone amp. All right, so on the other side, we have our audio out. This is basically an extension of the three and a half millimeter audio jack that comes from the split fire. And so this would feed the audio in on my audio interface and basically capture the game audio. Then here's the video out. This is coming out of the upscaler, in my case, the Framemeister. And so this is the HDMI that would run into my capture card. And then over here, this is the power strip. And what I did to make it easy to make this hole here and feed the power strip through was I cut the end off of the power plug and put this Molex on there. And then on the other end, I made the mating pair and here's the power plug. So it ended up actually working out quite nice because now it's a lot more modular. I just have to plug this guy in and then I've got my power here. So it actually ended up working out even better than I, than I anticipated. That way I didn't have to make this huge plug, you know, this huge hole here to feed this guy through. So uh, yeah, it worked out nicely. So that's the other side. And then lastly on the back side is simply my headphone jack. So this feeds the headphone amp and allows me to plug my headphones in. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find any smaller couplers than this. And I guess it makes sense because if you think about it, a quarter inch phono jack, is you know like that long and so if you double it it is going to be pretty long but i did run out of space inside my case here and so it does stick out quite a bit so i get a little bit leery a little nervous that i might break this off so i have to be careful when i'm handling the case it's not quite that rugged and all of these um all of these plugs this hdmi the headphones i went through and i used these plastic or these nylon washers to kind of secure everything in place and these are all super glued down so it is pretty sturdy, but I still have to be careful. And if you look off to the side here, you can see this is the audio in um, for the headphone amp. So again, I have to be a little bit careful, but, uh, but yeah, that's basically everything in a nutshell. Okay, so to demonstrate, let's use Marble Madness. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is come up to Marble Madness here. And I like to find a spot for the case on the floor, usually like a cabinet or two over. So maybe we'll go like right here. Set that guy down there. Okay, we can open the case up here. Let's take the remotes out. Take the cover off for the OSSC. And then the first thing I like to do is just plug the power in. So I'm going to take my cord here, plug one end on this side, and then we'll take the plug side and plug it into my extension cord there. And then I'll just turn on the power switch here. And from here, we will go to the Marble Madness coin door and let's open this up here. And inside, you can see here's our video wiring that we'll plug our harness into and then into our uh, capture setup. So to get started, we're going to disconnect the video signal there. And of course, you know, if you look up at the monitor here, there's no picture, but of course that's nothing to be worried about because we just disconnected it. And then we've got our harnesses that we will attach to these two Moluxes and then they will run into our capture setup. So I'm first going to plug in the harness. This is for the video out. This will actually feed our capture. And if you remember, here's my uh, drain wire ground. So I'm going to attach that here. And we'll plug the other end into the video in connector on the capture rig. And we'll plug one end of the other harness into the video out here. And plug the other end into our monitor. And the first thing you'll notice is now we have a picture. 
So that's a good sign. That just means that the split fire is doing its job. Then we need to connect the audio, so we'll use our little audio harness here. Okay, so here are our connectors for our audio. And you'll notice there's two, and that's because Marvel Madness is a stereo game. It has two speakers. And on my harness, I do have two inputs. So we will disconnect both of these here. And let's plug them in. Like so. And if you remember before, I mentioned that I am going to be wearing a microphone when I stream, so I don't want any audio coming out of the speakers. I'm going, I'm going to use headphones. And that's why we don't plug anything in here. Okay, and then we will plug in the quarter inch input into our audio in that feeds the headphone amp. And then we will plug in the game audio into our Molex here. Like so. Then we will come over to the other side of the capture rig here. And basically, we need to plug our audio out and our HDMI out in. For the audio out, I've just got my uh, audio cable here. It's really long. But as you can see, there's a three and a half millimeter on one end and then the quarter inch, which will feed the audio interface, which also goes into my computer. So we'll plug the three and a half millimeter in. And then I'll plug the other end into my audio interface like so. And then as for the HDMI, I've got a cable that I keep permanently plugged into my computer. This HDMI cable here, this is a very long HDMI cable. And I can just grab it like this, come over here, and plug it in. Okay, so with that done, the last piece of the puzzle is simply to plug my headphones in. So I'm just going to close this here so you can see the back. You can probably see this sticking out here. This is my audio jack, and I'm just going to plug my headphones in there like that. And then I now have audio. And then if I need to adjust the volume, I can just grab this number two knob here since I have my headphones plugged in on input number two and use that to increase or decrease the volume. And then I like to just put my headphones on the cabinet for the time being. Um, I also close the coin door a little bit just to keep the cords out of the way. But uh, yeah, you can kind of see it's not the cleanest setup. There are some a fair amount of cords on, on the ground, but uh, it's not too bad. Um, let me put the camera on the tripod and I can give you another uh, angle of this. All right, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of a better idea. Again, there are some cords on the floor, but uh, in the end, it's really not that bad. What do you think? Okay, so inside my capture software, we have a nice picture perfect image of our Marble Madness. And of course, you can't hear the audio because I don't have the attract sound on. So what I will do now is um, let me hop on the machine and I will start a game so you can hear the audio playing through. All right, give me a second here. Okay. Let's get a game going here. I'm just going to play probably two levels. Ooh, got to turn the sound down. My ears are blowing up. Oh, what the hell, I'll keep going. <laughs> See if I can do this. Ah! I only try that once. What? Time to use both trackballs. Ah! 
God damn it. I'm too impatient. <laughs> I'm not going to make it. Yeah. All right. Well, there's a demonstration. All right, so there you have it. That's what I came up with. And I'm sure that there are plenty of other ways to accomplish the same thing. This is just a solution I came up with. So you don't have to copy it. And in fact, if anything, I hope this video serves as kind of a guide to point you in the right direction so that you can save some time and money and frustration. But uh, as for me, I do plan on streaming my games on a fairly regular basis. I haven't decided what that schedule's like yet, so I don't know if it's going to be once a week or once every other week or on the weekends. I haven't figured that out yet. And I also haven't figured out what platform I should be streaming to. Since I'm brand new to live streaming, I don't know if I should be on Twitch or YouTube or Facebook or Mixer or any of these other platforms. So actually, if you guys have a suggestion, uh, leave a comment below. I would be real interested to know what that is. So anyways, with that said, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was a little bit interesting. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And I will see you in the next video. Wow.